Okay, terrific. <laughs> All right, welcome to the podcast engineering show. I am very happy that you're here. Thank you for tuning in. I know you could be doing anything else right now, but you're listening to this episode. I appreciate that. If you ever need help with anything, remember, you can always reach out to me. The website is podcastengineeringschool.com. So today's episode, we're going to talk about some of the daily goodies that I've been posting every day on the website. These are little blog posts that I put out every day. They're very short and sweet, and you can receive them in your email. You can receive them every day or a weekly roundup email. So just go to the website. You can sign up for that. And thanks to everyone who comments on these daily goodie posts. You know, you can comment, you can reply, ask a question, share your thoughts on the daily goodie. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty easy too. And uh, so we're going to cover about 10 or 12 of these. And I just wanted to also mention Podcasters Lounge. I don't know if you've been able to tune in yet. I've been streaming live every Wednesday evening for a couple hours. It's called the Podcasters Lounge. It's just us hanging out, us podcasters hanging out with each other, talking about anything. It's not anything serious. It's not, you know, training or anything. It's just it's just hanging out on a live stream. And also, if you know anybody who would like to learn more about the technical production of podcasts, please share this show with them. You know, this show can really help people understand audio production and learn more about the, you know, the words and the meanings and all this stuff. So if you know anybody who's podcasting who, you know, maybe just share this show with them and say, hey, maybe you should check out the podcast engineering show. I don't know. I'm just saying you could, you could, if there is, not that you should just go share it with everybody, but if you have like one person in mind and be like, hey, maybe check out this show. So anyway, also the next semester of Podcast Engineering School starts on September 10th. That's right. So we go in mid-August, we're going to be at Podcast Movement in Orlando. And then September 10th, we start the next semester of Podcast Engineering School. And if you're going to be at Podcast Movement, definitely come say hello. We're going to have a booth for Podcast Engineering School. And I'm also going to be emceeing all the technical presentations on the technical track. So... Yeah, come say hi. So let's get into these daily goodies. All right, first one is from, uh, well, I'm starting on May 10th. For a while, I was kind of keeping current, but now I've fallen behind like almost, what, two mo- almost two months now, but it's okay because you get to read it and then like, you know, a month and a half later, you'll hear me talk about it. So it kind of reinforces the the learning. So for May 10th, the envelope of sound, the envelope of of sound. So this is how sound actually happens and travels through the air. Uh, there's four phases or four stages, you might say. There's the attack, the decay, the sustain, and the release. And this is really easy to think about. Think about a piano key, right? Let's say you strike a piano key and it's like, bung. Now, the initial attack is the initial, as soon as you you know, press the piano key, right? So it's kind of like a spike in the, in the audio waveform, right? So it's kind of, it's a quick spike. That's called the attack. Then there's the decay, which is when it comes down from that sharp attack. And, and the, the attack and decay are very quick. They happen very quick. It's like a boom, you know, like really quick attack and decay. And then there's the sustain, which is the note ringing out like the piano, like Bung, like it rings out. That's the sustain. And then there's the release when when you either release the piano key or it just, you know, decays so much that it just kind of fades away into negative infinity, right? It just kind of goes away. Um, so those are the four stages and they're really helpful in audio production because these are the same controls you have on compressors and expanders, and gates and things like that. So there's an attack time or release time. So you, anyway, just knowing that that's the envelope of sound, it really helps you understand a little more how to adjust compressors and and gates uh, because they have the same controls on them. So, all right, next one, the JBL LSR 305 monitors. All right, these are monitors. These are monitor speakers 
and they're near field monitors, which means they're, you know, closer to the engineer and, and usually they're smaller speakers as well, near field, as opposed to the big monitors in the wall in, in a studio, which for, of course for podcasting, for podcast production, none of us have big monitors built into the wall. Um, so these JBL monitors are, so here's the thing. When I was going to buy new monitors, I researched monitors a lot and I was very careful to make sure that the monitors I chose were sort of had a very flat frequency response because you don't want for, for audio engineering purposes, you don't want the speakers to have all this huge bass and all this, you know, clarity, shimmering treble and all this nonsense, right? You just want flat frequency response speakers because as an engineer, that's what you need to hear. And so I decided on buying my Neumann KH120A speakers. Those are the speakers I bought. But in my searching for near field monitors, I found these JBL LSR 305s and they're much less expensive. They're about $300 for a pair, which is really good. And I haven't heard them myself ever, but a lot of people online in the pro audio forums and stuff, they really, a lot of people said that for the money, these are really good. Like they're not the best speakers in the world, but for $300 for a pair, they're actually really, really good in terms of being near field monitors. So, so I would say, you know, if anybody ever asked me like, Hey, what are some inexpensive monitors I could buy? Like I would suggest these again, I've never heard them. So if you do want near field monitors and you do buy them, just make sure, you know, you can return them if you don't like them. Right. Cause you know, you need to be able to return them or else you'll be stuck with them. So anyway, those are some supposedly good monitors. All right, next one from May 12th, Backpack Studio. Yeah, Backpack Studio is an app for iOS. So it's for Apple devices uh, like iPads and iPhones and stuff. And apparently it's like, it's almost like a multi-track DAW. Now I was approached by the guy who created this and he offered to give it to me for free. I think it costs like 15 bucks, but um, he gave me a code to get it for free, but then the, somehow the code didn't work, or I used the code wrong, or I put the code in and it didn't work, and then I tried to, then I realized I did it wrong, and I tried to put the code in again, and it said, oh, you've already used that code. So anyway, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to buy it for 15 bucks. Thing is, though, I haven't yet tried it. I bought it for my iPad. I installed it. You know, I registered it or whatever you do. I don't know. You just buy it through the, the, the app store and then it, whatever. But I haven't used it yet. But uh, maybe at Podcast Movement, I will try this because apparently this has a lot of features, including uh, an automatic mixing function. So maybe it, it sort of levels the voices and the music or whatever. Uh, it has compression and limiting and EQ, which you can use on each track. It has an adjustable ducking function. so if you play sound clips, it'll sort of duck your voice when the sound clip, clip plays, or it'll duck the sound clip when your voice plays. I'm, I'm not sure, or maybe both. I don't know. Apparently you can publish to various destinations right from the app. So maybe you can just record and then just publish a podcast from there. I really don't know. Anyway, it looks kind of cool. And this is a, the, the guy who made the backpack studio app. He, all, he previously, it was called something else, but he changed the name and he updated everything. And, it has great reviews, so I don't know. Maybe one day I'll try it. I'll let you know, you know, if I like it. Typically, I, well, as you may know, I'm more of a studio guy, so uh, I'm not really into going on location and like trying to record multi-track. Although I do sometimes, but if I was going to go on location and record multi-track, I would probably bring my Zoom H6 or maybe even my my Sound Devices Mix Pre Six. So recording on an iPad, like I, I would probably never do that, but you know, Hey, if you're like out camping or if you're in pl a place where it's just easy to have an iPad and an app, well then, oh, and by the way, with that backpack studio app, you can connect audio interfaces like the Focusrite 2i2, for instance, I know you can connect the Focusrite 2i2 to your iPad and then record in the backpack studio app multi-track. So anyway, all right, next one from May 13th, Zencaster. Well, Zencaster is 
the voice over IP recording service that I, I've been using for a long time. I use Zencaster a lot. I use Squadcast, not as much, but definitely use Squadcast. And I also pay for Ringer, and I rarely use Ringer, uh, only when you know the other two might be down or whatever. I just, as a podcast producer, I need tools in my toolbox to get the job done if I need if I need to get the job done. So I use all three of them. Uh, I did a sound test, like an audio quality test between those three a couple months ago, maybe three, four months ago now. And uh, in my estimation, Zencaster had the clearest and best quality audio, but Squadcast was very, very close. It was just a hair behind. So Zencaster and Squadcast are very comparable. They're both good. Of course, Squadcast, you get to see each other on video if you want to as well. Um, so Zencaster is great. And also one thing I recently did, oh, it's actually a recent daily goodie. So maybe I shouldn't tell you, but I'll just mention it that in Zencaster, you can turn off the echo cancellation. You can turn it on or turn it off. And so what happens is if someone does not have headphones or earbuds and they, and they need to listen through their speakers in their room, you can turn on the echo cancellation within Zencaster, and then it sort of does that ducking thing that Skype does and, and everything else. So kind of cool. You can turn it on and off. And normally you should leave it off. If everyone's wearing headphones, you don't need echo cancellation and you don't want it. You don't want the ducking thing to happen. People to get muted just because someone else, you know, says like, mm-hmm, uh-huh. And then like you just, it ruins it. All right, next one. Attack and release times for compression. And by the way, I didn't mention that these daily goodie episodes, they're every other week. And on, on the alternate weeks, I actually interview people. So I, I, I know. Oh, well, I waited way too long to say that. I was supposed to say that in the intro. Dang it. All right. Anyway, attack and release times for compression. So when you use a compressor, which of course compresses the dynamic range of the audio, uh, there's... Two of the most handy settings are attack and release. And I'll just, I'm just going to quickly, oh, this is because I got a note from Chip. Thanks, Chip, for sending in your note and your questions. And he asked about, you know, attack and release. And I basically told him that the attack time of the compressor will determine how much of the initial transient gets through before the compressor kicks in. So, you know, when you say transient, like, Tiny. Let's say the word tiny. The T on the t on the word tiny, that's a transient. It's like a spike in the wave. So tiny. Like if, if you made the attack time really short, it would crush that transient. It would, it would catch it really quick and squash it down. It would compress it down. But if you had the attack time longer, it would let the T from, it would let the transient from the T in tiny it would let that through and then the compressor would kick in. So the attack time, you can adjust it and you could see how much you're sort of crushing the beginnings of, of words or of transients. So that's a good way to think about attack time. And the release time, well, that's how long it takes the compressor to release after the level goes below the threshold. But in as far as perception goes, the the release time can make this can make the voice sound like it's closer like more in your face and that's if you have a shorter release time the the voice will sound more like it's in your face or if you use a little bit longer release time it'll sort of make the voice sound like it's not in your face like a little bit away like maybe 5 feet away from your face just not right up in your face like it'll be like wherever the speakers are or it'll be it's hard to explain these things, right? Because it's just perception. So, yeah, normally I think release times, I normally use around 300 for a voice. Let's say between 220 and 350. I don't know. And I don't adjust them that much. Like, you can, if you use something in that range, you could just use it on every voice pretty much. But if you really want to get nutty, you can just adjust adjust the release times and the attack times to your preference. So, and as you can tell, 
attack time. There's a lot more in, that goes into attack times and release times, but I'm I'm just giving you the brief overview here, right? So if you have questions, go to that blog post and ask it the question, and I'll answer you. All right, next is the cloud lifter. Well, Roger Cloud, who I met at NAB, he gave me a cloud lifter. I'm sad to report that I haven't actually tried it yet or used it yet. Again, it doesn't. It's not something that I need to use in my setup, so I will try it soon. And but you know, the cloud lifter is a great device that adds 25 dB of clean gain to your microphone. So if you're using a mic like an SM7B or another microphone, which has a sort of a weaker output, like a weak output, the cloud lifter will boost up that output so that you don't have to tax your mic preamp so much. So because like an SM7B, if you plug it into a really weak preamp, you pretty much have to crank the preamp all the way up and then you get like some more hiss and preamp noise and sometimes like crunchy distortion. So you never want to crank your mic pre all the way up. Like if you're going past 80% of your mic pre, you got to be careful. So so the reason for the cloud lifter and there's an, there's another device called a FET head and there's one called a dynamite and there's others. They add gain to the microphone signal before it gets to the preamp. So then on your preamp, you don't have to crank it up 100%. Maybe you only have to crank it up to 65%, right? Because the signal is much stronger even before it gets to the preamp. So the cloud lifter, great device. It's pretty small. Uh, oh, the thing with the cloud lifter, though, you do need phantom power. So you need to plug it into a preamp that can provide phantom power to the cloud lifter. So, so it's kind of like using a condenser microphone because when you use a condenser, you need phantom power. And when you use a cloud lifter, you need phantom power. I'm not sure if the Fed head and the dynamite or whatever, I don't know if they need phantom power. I forget because I, I, I don't use them. Maybe if you know, you could put it in the comments or something. So, all right. Well, Podcasters Lounge, that's actually the next post on the website. So I mentioned the, the lounge before, but hopefully you can tune in. Just search for it on YouTube or Twitch or Facebook. We have a Facebook group called the Podcasters Lounge. So, all right. The next one from May 16th, the art of fading music, the art of fading music. So here's, you know, whenever I listen to a podcast and the music is faded in a way that's just terrible... I know it's an amateur person who's producing that audio because fading is an art and you have, and, and like you can fade things very gently and almost uh, transparently. That's the word you can fade music. I mean, the music is there for a reason, right? To set the vibe and all that. But when you fade out music too quickly, it's like, what, wait, what happened? Where'd it go? And so you faded music out nice and slow. So it just fades out in the background. It fades to nothing. And so it doesn't bring any attention to itself. Like if you fade out something too quick, it's like jarring for the listener. So anyway, and, and also the level of music, but this is about the fading of music. So anyway, I could talk about fading forever. It's actually like an art. And then of course, Rob left a good comment here. It would be great if you could provide images of what those slopes could look like because I talk about, you know, fading it out in a straight line slope like in in the in in your daw you can you know slope down the slope down the volume line but so here's the thing rob i would love to include images and everything but these daily goodies are just little tidbits and here's the thing so i replied to rob and i said hey rob try fading some tracks on your own using your ears to decide what sounds good and take what i said into account so that's definitely what you should do with all this stuff Take what I mention into account and then try it yourself, but use your ears. I mean, you can see things. You can, you know, if you need to be shown how to fade things gently, like that's fine. But like, you know, you can look up tutorials on YouTube of how to fade things. That's fine. But like in the end, it's all about your ears. So you have to listen. You have to try fading it out and then listen to the fade. And then if it's too abrupt or too long or something, then adjust it and listen again. All right. The next post was uh, an episode of this show. And the next one from May 17th, mouth clicks. Oh, boy. Well, mouth clicks are these little lip 
little lip and mouth click noises that people make, and they're pretty disgusting. Uh, especially when you start hearing them, then you then you kind of hear them. I won't say you hear them everywhere because not everyone makes mouth click noises. Uh, some people make a ton of mouth click noises, and so anyway, there is a way. First of all, to prevent mouth clicks, it mouth clicks occur because of dehydration. So make sure you're, you're drinking enough water and all that. And then also one thing that makes mouth clicks stick out more is if you're not projecting your voice enough. Meaning like I'm projecting my voice, but some people, they almost whisper, you know, they they do their podcast and they're, they're almost whispering. And when you, when you almost whis when you're almost whispering, because there's not much sound coming out of your mouth, the lip smacks and the mouth clicks are you know, relatively even louder because your voice is a lower volume. Now your mouth clicks seem way louder. So you should project. Like when you're talking, you should project. You don't whisper, like talk, just talk normal volume. I know some people talk at a lower volume than others. That's fine. I talk at a louder volume. I'm a loud talker, which actually is a really good thing when it comes to recording audio, believe it or not, right? Because my voice is louder and then the background noise and even my mouth clicks or whatever are comparatively lower in volume. But someone who like sort of whispers, man, you're going to hear background noise. You're going to hear all kinds of mouth noises. So, uh, and so then you can avoid them, but then you can also get rid of them. And after the fact, of course, Isotope RX-7 has a mouth de-click module, which is awesome. And also I recently bought a plugin called Spiff from Oak Sound, which also can remove mouth clicks and mouth noises. Um, so you can get rid of them afterwards. Actually, thank God for RX-7 to get rid of mouth clicks. Um, because for my clients and everybody, it's like if I hear some mouth clicks, I just run it through the the mouth de-click. And it does a great job. And it wow. Anyway. All right. Next one. Mastering using plugins on your master bus. Okay, so I'm just going to read this one. It's a, it's one paragraph. It, wait, it's one sentence. <laughs> oh, this is a long sentence, but okay. I'll read the title again. Mastering using plugins on your master bus. Instead of rendering your mix and then bringing it into another application like Ozone 8 or RX-7 to perform the mastering, you could use plugins on the master bus of your multitrack DAW mix session and do some of the mastering right there. Of course, you would still have to set the final luffs level after rendering your mastered mix. So here's the thing. You could just mix your episode out of your DAW and then do the mastering. And of course, the mastering is like when you can add a little EQ, a little compression, you know, things like that, just to tighten it up. And of course, the other part of mastering is the final level, the luffs level, right? But one thing you could do is, and it's one thing I do, is I put some of my mastering processors, like my Ozone 8, which is compression and EQ and limiting, I put that on the master bus of my DAW of Reaper. So when I'm mixing my episode, I'm actually mixing it and I'm sort of mastering it in the same step. So when I render it out of Reaper, it's already been mixed and mastered, and the only thing left for me to do is to level it to the proper LUFS level, so... That was that was what I meant to get across in that little post, that little daily goodie. The next one is is titled Listening to the Podcast Engineering Show, which you're doing right now. But I will mention I you know, this is episode 138. And isn't there a a, a song We Are 138 by the Misfits or something? We Are 138. I don't know. I was never into the Misfits really, but I know they were influential in the punk scene and all that. Anyhow, this is episode 138. That means I've done so many interviews before this. So if there are episodes, you know, maybe even like episode 75 or episode 55, like if there's or anything below episode 50, if there's any that you haven't heard, you can go back and listen to them. You know, you can binge listen to this show. I'll I'll give you permission to do that. <laughs> and, you know, one thing you can do, by the way, is if you go back to my the previous episodes of the show, and if you look on the website, podcastengineeringschool.com, in the post itself, you could sort of see what equipment that my guest has. And so 
if you see that my guest has like almost the exact equipment that you have, then that might be a good episode for you to listen to because then we're going to be talking about the exact equipment that you have and you might pick up a lot of knowledge there. Okay, next one, diffraction. Diffraction. Have you ever spoken to a person in the next room when you couldn't see them because your line of sight was your line of sight directly to them was blocked by a wall? Right? Like if someone's in another room and you can't see them like eye to eye, you can still talk to them, right? You could say, "Hey, Hey, honey, can you bring me a drink or bring me some water, right? Well, they can hear you, right? They can hear you around a corner. Well, how can they hear you around a corner? That's because sound waves diffract as they travel through the air. So sound waves can go around corners. They can go under the little, you know, under a door if there's a little space. Like sound is like, sound waves are like waves in water. They just spread out and they travel and they can go around corners and stuff. That's called diffraction. And that's one of the reasons why soundproofing a studio is not that easy because sound just seems to get everywhere. So anyway, you have to, you know, not only block it, but absorb it and all that stuff. So anyway, that's a little bit about how sound travels. All right. Next one from May 21st, the Behringer XM 1800S. Yeah, this is a microphone. Behringer XM 1800S actually comes in a pack of three. <laughs> These mics are so inexpensive that they come in packs of three for $39.99. So for $39, you get three microphones. And the funny thing about these mics are that they're pretty good. They're, they're, not, they're not bad. You would think, oh, they're that cheap. They're not bad. In, in fact, Glenn the Geek from you know the horse radio network who has you know he has his morning show he does every day and he has like 13 or 15 other shows on his network and most of his hosts use this mic because he's he's buying these mics to give to the host and you know he can't buy you know expensive mics especially when they go on location he says like if they go on location and they you know sometimes they lose a microphone somewhere and it's like you don't want to lose a, an expensive mic. That 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 would hurt. <laughs> You'd be sad about that. So you can buy these cheap mics that actually still sound pretty good and use them. So point is, if you need a lot of microphones for something and you don't want to spend a lot of money, these are actually pretty good mics for that purpose. Uh and I know I had these at my microphone test drive when I did it uh, a couple of years ago at NAB and Podcast Movement. The the Behringer XM 1800S, they were in the lineup and they sound good. You know, I mean, they might not be the best sounding mic, but again, for what we're doing in podcasting, they sound good. And obviously you need to speak right into the microphone. That makes a big difference from close range, like one inch kind of thing. All right. Last one. You guys ready for the last one? Okay. Shep's Omni Channel. That's right. The Sheps Omnichannel plugin from Waves. This is a plugin from Waves, which is, this is the plugin that if I ever have to recommend one plugin to people, this is the one I recommend. And here's why. Because it's a channel strip plugin, which means it has all different kinds of processors within the one plugin. So it's called the Sheps Omnichannel. And within it, it has EQ, Filters, compressor, limiter, deesser. It actually has two deessers. It has a gate, it has saturation, and it has an insert point. So you can actually put another plug in in the, in the middle there if you want. So it's really an amazing plug in in that it does pretty much everything you would need to do in terms of mixing. Um, it's not going to fix audio, like it's not going to do the D mouth click or the D noise or the D hum. It's not Isotope RX-7, but after your audio is cleaned up and you go to the mixing phase, it has everything you would need in the mixing phase. And it often goes on sale for $29. Okay, normally it's $99, bucks, but it goes on sale very often for $29. So for $29, this is an amazing plugin to get. And the two DSers might be the, 
might be the best thing about this plugin. Although the compressor is really good. Actually, has three different types of compression you can choose between. The EQ is nice. The sound quality of this plugin is very, very good. And the fact that there's two DSers is just great because sometimes if sometimes a person will have such nasty sibilance that you actually need two DSers because one just doesn't cut it. <laughs> sometimes I use even three or four DSers on on certain people. So but having two DSers right within one plugin is really, really good. So the Shep's Omni channel, there you go. I mean, uh, whatever there's an affiliate link somewhere but don't worry about that it's waves waves has a lot of good plugins so that does it for this episode i hope you enjoyed the daily goodie overview this has been my goodie bag every other week and like i mentioned before every other week i interview an awesome person in the podcasting world and we really go in depth about the audio production aspects of podcasting we don't get into marketing and all the like all we talk about is audio production, hardcore. So anyway, again, if you want to, if you could recommend this show to, to one person, you know, I would greatly appreciate it and it would help them, you know, again, only if the person might need help with audio production, that's when you should recommend this show. Don't just spray it everywhere. Just if, if you know, if you can think of one person say, yeah, that, you know what? They might actually like this show and share it with them. All right. Well, we'll beat it back next week. And thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'm here to help. Again, I'm telling you, if you have any questions, just email me through the website and maybe I can help. I'm here to help. Okay. We'll see you all next week. Thanks. Bye.